Welcome to Our Hope, a production of Chosen People Ministries. It is almost time to take out our menorahs and start frying some latkes. Hanukkah is coming. This holiday is one of the most joyful festivals on the Jewish calendar, and it lasts for eight nights. However, many people do not know that Hanukkah commemorates one of the most intense wars, both on a cultural level and on the battlefield, that Israel ever experienced. On today's episode of Our Hope, we are going to explore the history behind this holiday, and we have invited back our National Ministry Representative, Dr. Alan Shore, to lead us on this journey. Dr. Shore, welcome back to Our Hope. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, put on your yarmulke. Here comes Hanukkah. <laughs> That's awesome. So since this is a Hanukkah-themed episode, I thought we should ask, what is your favorite Hanukkah dish? Well, nothing compares with the latkes, yeah. you know, the fried potato pancakes that are so delicious and you can have them with sour cream. You can have them with <laughs> applesauce. Applesauce was uh, my preferred topping for latkes as a boy, and it uh, remains so to this day. That's awesome. I, you know, I obviously did not celebrate Hanukkah growing up, but my Jewish friends, I always I was always jealous of them for getting gifts for eight days straight. Man, <laughs> so do you have any like fond memories from when you celebrated Hanukkah as a child or even still as an adult? Certainly, certainly the lighting of the candles was certainly mm. the, the highlight. Uh, we had very brightly colored candles as a boy. We get them at the Jewish center. And uh, now we use uh, beeswax calendars as we light the menorah in our home, mm -hmm. which makes a lovely, lovely fragrance. Mm -hmm. uh, as a child, we would spin the dreidel. Do you remember the dreidel? Yeah. Abe, it's a, a spinning top mm -hmm. with the four uh, Hebrew letters, Nis, Gadol, Haya, Sham, a great miracle happened there. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a game, a spinning game where people put uh, Hanukkah gelt mm -hmm. into the pot yeah. and play for Hanukkah gelt, which are uh, gold coin. Well, it's chocolate coins wrapped in gold foil. Yeah. So it was a lot of fun. Great fun. That's awesome. So what does the word Hanukkah mean? And why was this name given to the holiday? Well, the name of the holiday, Hanukkah, is, is dedication. It's the Feast mm. of Dedication. So the highlight of the Feast of Dedication is the cleansing and rededication of the temple in Jerusalem, right. which had been defiled under the Syrian king Antiochus IV in a number of ways we can get into later. But the recapture of the temple and the re-cleansing of the temple, rededication of the temple um, under uh, the Maccabees is what the, the you know, the guerrilla warfare that uh, took place and the great battle that was won and the rededication of the temple is, uh, the, is basically the focal point. And there's a very complex context that revolves around that, but basically the rededication of the temple is the focal point. So you just mentioned this war. Why, why was this war even fought? Well, not to get too deeply into the weeds. Uh, after Alexander the Great passed away in the, by 323 BC, his kingdom was divided. Um, some of his generals got some of his territory. One of his generals, Seleucus, got the territory that uh, included Syria and also the land of Israel. And Seleucus had a, an answer, well, a descendant by the name of Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus God Revealed. He had a very high opinion of himself. Mm. And around 175 or so, he began to oppress the Jewish people. Um, he made it impossible for Jewish people to follow their faith under, the, under pain of death. He forbade 
sacrifice in the temple. He forbade the reading of the Torah. He forbade circumcision. He forbade the dietary laws. Mm -hmm. And uh, in short, attempted to make the children of Israel into uh, into good good Syrians uh, who were deeply influenced by the Greek uh, mm -hmm. Hellenic culture. So, all right, there was a revolt. There was pushback. Um, there was also quite a number of people uh, unfortunately, we can get into this a little bit later also, but there were many Jews that were all right with this. They liked Greek culture. They liked the goodies that uh, that they could get if they assimilated into Greek culture. But there were those staunch, faithful few that saw it for what it was, saw it as a betrayal of the mission of the Jewish people um, under the Abrahamic covenant to be the light of the God of Israel to the nations and they revolted. Mm -hmm. They began a guerrilla war that lasted for some years that culminated in, in victory. They mm -hmm. were able to, as I say, recapture Jerusalem, rededicate the temple, and, um, and in the course of time, uh, establish a semi-autonomous kingdom of their own. You just mentioned that some didn't mind the influence on their nation. Um, why do you think Israel was so divided at this time. And then follow up to that, when they win this war, um, just curious, obviously you weren't there. <laughs> Otherwise you'd be very old. But why do you- so Instead of just reasonably old, is that what you're saying? Okay. So, it, you know, so why do you think Israel was divi so divided? And also when they won the war, how do you think those who didn't mind that culture felt after, the Greeks were defeated. Well, first one has to remember that there were Jews all over what was formerly the empire of Alexander the Great. So it wasn't just just in Israel, land of Israel and in Jerusalem where the Jews were. Now, even to the days of Jesus, there was this cultural division between the Greek and the Hebrew speaking Jews. Mm. We read about this in Acts 6. But going back to uh, where we are at the time of, of Hanukkah, which by the way is about um, you know 160, 165 uh, BC, which is of course 165 years before Jesus, Jesus was born, we have a situation not unlike today, and I can get into this a little bit uh, a little bit later, not unlike today where Many, many of the Jews were attracted by the goodies that uh, mm. that Greek civilization had to offer to them, and were um, were tempted to do the trade that Jews have been offered the carrot in front of the Jewish nose for centuries and centuries and centuries. If only you will give up your sense of your own particular distinctiveness and mission in the world, and and be like us, you can have the goodies that mm. we have to offer you. And there were many Jews who were uh, fine with that. They bought into that. Now, yeah, and even and and this civil war, you know, went on for some little time after the Maccabees recaptured Jerusalem and rededicated the temple. And there were actually there was actually warfare taking place between um, between Hellenized Jews who were actually on the side of the uh, the, the Greek Greco Syrians mm. and the Jews who wanted to remain true to their own faith. Uh, the fact of the matter is the Maccabees, who were what that name means hammer, these wonderful guerrilla revolutionaries mm -hmm. that actually managed to wrest their independence from the hands of Antiochus IV, that they were great revolutionaries, but they were terrible rulers. Mm. They became, their rule just degenerated into the same despotic uh, ancient Near East uh, monarchy that uh, that was all over the place. You know, we think of Herod as the as the um, epitome of that. But there were there were difficulties. The Maccabees took control of the high priesthood, and there was always meant to be a division between the Israelite monarchy and the Israelite high priesthood. The the descendants of the Maccabees attempted to consolidate those two roles and. Um, basically place uh, place the separation of church and state, if you will, uh, get rid of that, which they were not entitled to do. 
So there was lots and lots of struggle and conflict. And we, you know, we have echoes of that in the New Testament yeah. with the various sects and groups that were vying with each other. This is this is actual true history that was going on and it went on uh, even into New Testament times. So it's so fascinating because they're fighting against an empire, right? And they're so divided within themselves. How in the world did they win? Well, I'll tell you, you know, I, I've been giving a little bit of thought to this question because it, it, the Greco, the Greek Empire was not an empire in the same sense that Rome was an empire. Right. You know, it was a Hellenic civilization that spread across a broad, broad region, but there were not, there was not a centralized mm. um government in the way that Rome was the centralized government of, uh, of the Roman Empire. So basically, Antiochus had uh, a number of fish to fry. Mm -hmm. um, having, you know, keeping a kingdom together tends to divide, one atten divide one's attention. You had Egypt to worry about, you had Rome to worry about, and basically the guerrilla warfare that the Maccabees carried on against uh, this big well, it was well equipped. Equipped. It was uh, professional. It was a uh, an army that was uh, very, very big. But the guerrilla warfare that the Maccabees carried on just just gradually just wore them down, mm. and they they capitulated. Incredible. So when Israel dedicated the temple, the, the Maccabees took over the priesthood, and I believe you mentioned a little bit of that. Um, but they were not from the tribe of... They were not descendants. They were Levites, I believe, but they were not descendants of Aaron or Aaron's descendants. They were not qualified to have the high priesthood. Mm -hmm. they, they were a priestly family, but they were not qualified to occupy the office of high priesthood. And then the high priesthood, after after they got to control and their the Maccabees descendants <clears throat> were the rulers, it just became a political football. Mm. As a matter of fact, in the time of Jesus, it was the Roman procurator who appointed the high priest. Mm. So you know the idea of an ironic high priest went out the window uh, by the time by the time uh, you know Jesus Jesus comes on the scene. Mm. In thinking about Hanukkah, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about Purim. Uh, it, it's a historical holiday. How is it different from the Levitical feasts? It's a lot different in terms of its status. And you you mentioned all of the, the your your Jewish buddies getting uh, <laughs> presents uh, eight nights. Let me tell you, my, Hanukkah was a minor festival, mm -hmm. a minor festival in Judaism for centuries until we got to the United States mm -hmm. and all of the hoopla that revol revolved around Christmas made Jewish parents say, you know what, we've got to do something about this yeah. because our kids want us to set up Christmas trees and give us Christmas presents, mm -hmm. give them Christmas presents. We have got to uh, stand up for ourselves here. So Hanukkah was sort of uh, put on steroids in the United yeah. States in yeah. order to give it uh, a status, uh, at least in the eyes of the children that was uh, at least equal with mm -hmm. Christmas. So it's, it's you know, for centuries, it's not an important holiday in that sense, but it's certainly become a very important holiday in Jewish, in Jewish culture. Right. So there are two symbols that when you see them, you automatically think Jewish. Or uh, the first one is a Star of David. When you see that, you just know that's, you know, that's Jewish. That's a Jewish symbol. The second one is a menorah. And we know uh, that the menorah is a major symbol of Hanukkah in particular. Uh, so the Bible describes the menorah as a seven-branched lampstand. But the Hanukkah, which is the menorah used for Hanukkah, has nine branches. Why is that? All right. Menorah has become sort of a generic, uh, a generic word for, you know, for a candelabra, you know, uh, candles. So seven branches, that's the, that is the menorah that is uh, for the temple. In fact, you can visit the Third Temple Institute in, uh, in Jerusalem today. You can see a big seven branch candle mm -hmm. that uh, will be part of the furnishings of, of the Third Temple if and when that should come about. Uh, now, the Hanukkah menorah lamp uh, technically is called a Hanukkah mm -hmm. because it has nine candles. Eight of those candles commemorate the eight 
days and nights of the holiday of Hanukkah. And the, if you've seen menorahs, you know that one of the candles in the middle is, is elevated. That is called the shamash, which is the servant candle. And, you know, for believers in Messiah, it's, it's not a hard stretch to see the lighting of the servant candle, which in turn lights the lower candles with the same light. Mm. So it's not a hard stretch for believers to understand that we burn with the same light that Yeshua uh, has been authorized to give us through the power of the Spirit. Wow. Now, that's not a mainstream Jewish interpretation, obviously, yeah. but it's certainly one that inspires me. Yeah. So it's nine candles for the Hanukkah, which is not the menorah that sits in the temple, which is seven-branched. Incredible. Thank you for that. We'll be right back. Shalom. My name is Nicole Vaca, and I'm one of the co-producers of Our Hope podcast. We created Our Hope to be a window into the Messianic community, a place where we can discuss Israel and the Bible, and a resource for people who want to share their faith more effectively and compassionately with the Jewish community. If you are interested in supporting what we do, you can donate to Chosen People Ministries at chosenpeople.com slash donate. You can also support us by sharing this podcast on social media with your friends and family or by writing a review on Apple Podcasts. We are so grateful for your support and we hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. So let's jump to Hanukkah today. We talked a lot, a lot about the, uh, the historical part of it. Um, but what are some of the foods and traditions we see in Hanukkah celebrations? Well, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not that different from, uh, from what it was, um, you know, earlier on, just in terms of the food being oil oil is the thing the mm -hmm. fried food because the oil represents and this is the miracle of hanukkah which i don't think we touched upon just yet the miracle of hanukkah is this as the story is usually told that when the maccabees reconquered jerusalem and cleansed the temple they had to light you know the eternal light that burns in the temple which is supposed to burn uh, every day they only had enough consecrated, purified oil to last one day. Mm. So they had to go and procure more. And it took eight days for them to get more. And during the eight days of Hanukkah, the light burned, the oil burned miraculously, the one day worth of oil burned miraculously for eight days. So that is primarily the miracle of Hanukkah. That's the niece. Mm -hmm. That's the miracle. A great miracle happened here. That is the miracle that is being referred to. Mm -hmm. And as a result, oil becomes a very important uh, symbol in the storytelling of Hanukkah. And so foods are fried in oil. The latkes are fried in oil. Mm -hmm. There is an Israeli donut called sutganya. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a kind of a jelly donut that's fried uh, in oil. So the latkes and the sutganya, which are fried in oil, highlight Hanukkah. Now, Hanukkah has also become a, a symbol in Jewish life to stand up to oppression. Mm. Okay, now this is an important element. Now, remember, um, you know, several years ago, there were, was a, a spate of anti-Semitic incidents, and everybody was putting Hanukkahs who cared about this, Non-Jews were burning Hanukkahs in their windows mm. in solidarity with Jews who were, um, uh, you know, victimized by anti-Semitism. Right. So the element of standing up against oppression has become a, um, has been highlighted 
in, in recent years because of a spate of anti-Semitic attacks that have taken place uh, here and elsewhere. So that's one um, current events, contemporary meaning that has been highlighted in Hanukkah. And, you know, of course, the idea that the Jewish people stand for something, mm -hmm. uh, that there is sacrifice involved in carrying on Jewish life and tradition. That is also an element in uh, Hanukkah awareness, mm -hmm. if you will. And this also, I think, you know, if we get to this, there are one or two things that Christians can learn from the celebration of Hanukkah that are along these lines also. Yeah, I mean, Christians uh, typically see, or just people in general, see Hanukkah as the Jewish counterpart of Christmas, but it has such a rich history. So what would you say is the true meaning of Hanukkah, and, and what can we as believers learn from it? Well, the true meaning of Hanukkah uh, <laughs> is, goes back to the hidden history that I was referring to yeah. a little bit uh, earlier, because uh, its lesson is so urgent and so eerily up to date. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, it's not very nice. That's what we were talking about. That's why it's hidden, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And it is at the time that Antiochus attempted to fold Judaism into the political religious culture of the Hellenistic world, right. which would have effectively destroyed it. There were many Jewish people in the empire who seemed not to mind too much. Mm. And that uh, they were tired of being embarrassed by being different, perceived as old fashioned, uh, backward in a world filled with so many wonderful opportunities, if only they could learn to make their faith invisible and turn their backs on the identity that God had called them to. Mm -hmm. As a chosen people whose task was to reveal the glory of the one true God to the nations of the world, as the Lord had covenanted with them through their ancestor Abraham. Think of what would have happened if that had been a successful project. Where would there have been a community that the Messiah would have been born into at the time that was appointed for him to come? Where would the Israelites have been if they had all turned into good Greeks? Wow. Now, they say that Hanukkah is the Jewish Christmas. There's really not a great, they really don't have very much to do with each other on the surface. Right. They come at roughly the same year, at the same time of year and are uh, celebrated vigorously. But there is a meaning that Christians may, um, as I say, it's eerily up to date, the message that Hanukkah has for Christians, because there are many Christians today who don't want to. They're embarrassed <laughs> to be different. They are embarrassed to stand out. And they want to assimilate. They are basically assimilating into the ways of the world to an extent that um, some that ought to make, in my view, ought to make them uh, quite uncomfortable. So we are an ecclesia. The body of Messiah is the ecclesia, which means the called out ones. What are we being called out from? We are being called out from a way of life that essentially ignores God. We are being called toward a life that acknowledges God and, um, and we give ourselves into God's service. So the same kinds of human nature doesn't change a great deal over the centuries, I've noticed. When you look at how, how the scripture continues to speak to us, how the literature of the ancient world speaks to us, it's human nature. The temptations remain the same. The temptation to live as though God does not exist and our challenge to turn from that mindset to a mindset that acknowledges God joyfully and seeks to serve him zealously. Dr. Short, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Celebrating with family, beautiful traditions, eating delicious food, these are all part of what makes Hanukkah so fun. But the story of this holiday is what makes it truly wondrous. Hanukkah is a celebration of how it is God who gives us the victory in any battle we face. When we choose to trust and obey Him, we can have the assurance that He is fighting for us. 
we want to leave you with the following verse from Proverbs chapter 21, verse 31. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. On next week's episode of Our Hope, we will dive deeper into the gospel according to Hanukkah and how this holiday can be a great time to share the good news of our Messiah, Yeshua. Until then, Hanukkah begins this Thursday at sundown, so if you are celebrating, we hope you have a wonderful Hanukkah. Join us on Sunday, December 13th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a virtual children's Hanukkah program featuring songs, activities, and storytelling. You can sign up now at chosenpeople.com slash Hanukkah Kids. Thank you for listening to this episode of Our Hope. This episode was made possible thanks to Dr. Alan Shore, Nicole Vaca, Grace Sui, Kyron Bautista, Dr. Mitch Glazer. Until next time. Thanks for listening to Our Hope. If you like our show and want to know more, check out OurHoPodcast.com or ChosenPeople.com. See you next time.